When the emperor was going on any journey, he was always addressed by the heads of the civil authorities of the countries through which he traveled. In the first years of his government, all the addresses displayed a natural style and tone of language suitable to the respect due to the chief of the state and to the dignity of the magistrate who uttered it. But as it is in human nature for one person to act differently from his neighbor, the repetition of the same things become tiresome. An attempt was made at more elevated language. Rhetorical figures and historical quotations were adapted. Every resource of this art had, in short, been so completely exhausted that Paris was called in to assist in supplying fresh ones. Addresses were ordered from the capital so as to be received in time for the day on which they were to be delivered. The emperor, having been informed of the circumstance, would no longer suffer any to be uttered in the journeys he had to perform, or he would cut the orator short as soon as he perceived that a ready set language was held to him. He had no desire to hear what was not a candid and spontaneous expression of feelings. The Dutch, more than any other people, had adopted those means, and this was the only time they were disappointed in the expectations entertained their effect. The emperor had brought in his suite, his ministers of the marine, of the interior, and of the finances in order to clear up on the spot the numberless difficulties which he foresaw would necessarily result from the crowd of applications which he expected to receive. They returned direct from Amsterdam to Paris, but the emperor sent the ride as far as Metz during his journey to Holland. The diplomatic communications had followed their customary course. In France, an approaching rupture was expected because the emperor sent orders from Holland to the two regiments of Carabineers, which had recently returned to the quarters at Lunaville to proceed to the Rhine, and he was desirous to review them. They accordingly joined him, and whether the review was merely a pretext for their march or that their march was actually undertaken in contemplation of a rupture, they did not return to Lunaville. They were quartered in the country of Burke, where they lived at a cheap rate. This measure was besides rendered necessary by a slight insurrectionary movement in that country, added to which it was under any circumstances so much distance performed, although not exactly in the direction of Poland. The movement was made known at Paris and could not therefore be kept a secret from St. Petersburg. The intercourse was kept up by a mere outward forms of politeness and when coldness takes the place of clo close friendship, disunion soon follows. The only difficulty is in the first falling off. When the ice is once broken, animosity is not long in making its appearance. No extraordinary event had taken place in any quarter in Spain. The armies were engaged in carrying on a few insignificant sieges and in consolidating themselves. The blockade of Badajoz had been raised in the month of June of the present year. As I have already mentioned, the army of Andalusia was before Cadiz. Nearly the whole of Spain was occupied, but neither orders nor obedience could be enforced beyond the spot where our troops were stationed. Even there, the king's commands were set at naught. And this prince, tired at hearing the complaints of the Spaniards, whose condition he felt it impossible to relieve, had ended by not interfering in anything, so that this unfortunate country was divided into as many vice royalties as there were generals in command of particular districts. To add to our misfortunes, few of them were free from the animadversions of the Spaniards. These local vexations gave rise to a state of exasperation which converted the war into one continued system of massacre and blunder. There were but few amongst the generals who kept their reputation untarnished in those that unfortunate campaign, and many insurgent Spanish generals have told me that it was greatly owing to this circumstance that they, on their part, refused to listen to any accommodation, because when they happened to enter places which had been occupied by our troops, they discovered that King Joseph's authority was not even alluded to and that it was such and such general who issued orders in respect to every branch of the administration so that if they had yielded obedience, they would also have been placed under the command of a French general. They therefore preferred, as they said, to remain in their then existing situation. The glory of our arms in that country has been greatly thrown back in consequence of the emperor being prevented performing a journey there. Everyone would have returned to his duty 
Even before he had approached within a hundred leagues of the frontier, the emperor was well aware of it and was on the point of proceeding to that quarter when the English succeeded in forcing Russia into a war. A singular occurrence was taking place at Naples. The king had felt greatly offended at the measures adopted in respect to his chamberlain and the young officers of the legation. And as he dared not find fault with the emperor, he was loud in his complaints against his ministers. The emperor was still at from Paris. I saw as many Neapolitan couriers arrive there as if some important negotiation had been set on foot, and these couriers, who were mostly Frenchmen, executed commissions in almost every corner of Paris, after having delivered their ministerial dispatches to the Neapolitan ambassador. I was well aware of their places of resort and of the ground to so much punctuality, but my curiosity was not fully satisfied. The bad opinion which I personally entertain are the king's secret designs and the absence of the emperor authorized me on the one hand to feel great mistrust and on the other to exercise greatest caution. I gave orders that under pretense of some awkward mistake, a Neapolitan courier should be arrested instead of another courier and placed for a couple of hours at my disposal. This bold measure was suggested to me by another circumstance. The report was freely circulated that in a fit of spleen, the Neapolitan government had compelled all Frenchmen who had at her solicitation exchanged the French for the Neapolitan service to have themselves immediately naturalized or returned to France. The greater part left the Neapolitan army in consequence of this order, this act of the government, which either indicated insanity or a vengeful spirit, was not to be overlooked. The first Neapolitan courier was not long in making his appearance, and my instructions were so judiciously carried into effect that he was brought to my hotel. Those who conducted him there were, in fact, under the impression that they had actually committed a mistake, with the exception, however, one person who was in the secret of my intentions. They expected to be reprimanded and received, on the contrary, some proof of my satisfaction. I opened every paper, even the ambassador's packet, and sent it back to him with so much hate that he might have had doubts of its being anything more than a mistake if his experience had not told him otherwise. Those dispatches communicated that the king of Naples entertained great uneasiness with respect to the emperor's feelings towards him, since he could no longer be ignorant of the fact that the emperor had read many papers which reflected great discredit on the writer, and above all, since the compulsory measure which required all Frenchmen to become naturalized or to return to France. His mind was so much harassed at this idea that he had just set off the queen to clear up a misunderstanding which had no other existence than in his own imagination. For a king of Naples, who had been seated on his throne by the aid of the emperor's power, had only to remain quiet and not to attempt making any more noise in Europe than was consistent with his political insignificance. He would never in that case have to apprehend being hurled from his throne by that hand which he had thought proper to raise him to it. If, moreover, it had really been the object of France to make the king of Naples resign his crown, could he reasonably have entertained the idea of defending himself? Such... An enterprise would have covered him with ridicule if, therefore, he deemed it useful to his interest to induce the queen to pay the emperor a visit to Paris. The reason is that he was sensible he stood in need of justifying his conduct, as none but madmen would attempt to persuade us that in the position which he occupied he had any intrigue to apprehend. His whole object was to find out the extent of the emperor's information respecting his proceedings. This is the proper place for mentioning that the emperor had already contemplated to separate the crown of Italy from that of France, and to bestow the former upon his successor. He only delayed making a declaration of that effect until the birth of a second son, who would have been king of all Italy. He had sometimes indulged with his friends in that pleasing hope, and as he treated the king of Naples as a man whom he considered to be inseparably linked to his system, the idea did not occur to him that he would ever dare to oppose his views if the anticipated event should occur. Nevertheless, this was really the case. Chapter 14. The queen of 
Naples, arrived in Paris previously to the Empress return from Holland. Her journey turned out to be one of pure enjoyments for herself as well as for those who felt a pleasure in again seeing her, but it was to no purpose with respect to the king, whom the Emperor knew too well to entertain the least uneasiness about him, whatever might be his conduct towards his benefactor. This circumstance tended still more to confirm my opinion that the mind of the king in Naples was constantly at work, and that in spite of himself he might be placed in positions of which he might not perhaps discover the danger. This is generally what happens to men who avoid appearing in their natural character, or who, having once failed, are always restless and uneasy. On his return to Paris, the emperor gave a most friendly welcome to the Queen of Naples and personally attended to everything that could be conducive to her comfort. I dare say he did not disguise from her his opinion respecting the conduct of the king, her husband. Nothing, however, transpired on the subject. The emperor, who has been represented as a man of naturally vindictive disposition, never took revenge of inquiries in any other way than by conferring favors. I might quote many instances of his prodigality towards persons who repaid him with ingratitude, and I never knew him to forget the most trifling service. He sometimes inquired into the details of the domestic affairs of those whose welfare he took a particular interest. This gave occasion for the report of his feeling, a curiosity to meddle in the private affairs of others. Nothing could be more far and from the truth. The fact was he intended to perform certain acts of liberality, and when he received a candid answer to his questions, it seldom happened that he omitted to give substantial proofs of his friendly intentions. No one ever felt more pleasure in distributing gifts, but he shunned every expression of thanks, though he never failed to notice and never could forget any want of gratitude. I have a perfect recollection that when he was first consul, he one day gave 30,000 francs to each of his aides de camp. We were eight in number, and went in the evening to thank him. At a moment when he was alone in his closet at the Palace of Malmaison, he received us as he would men who were acting a part by no means acceptable to him, and dismissed us from his presence in these words. Another time, gentlemen, I shall not expose myself to such visits. I ask no thanks at your hands, well aware that what I did would not be lost upon your feelings without there being any necessity for your coming to tell me so. He then added, in order to make up to us for this abruptness, go and enjoy yourselves. You are giddy fellows. He did not keep his word, for his liberality towards some of us has been carried even to prodigality. Towards the end of October, the emperor returned with the empress to St. Cloud, where the king of Rome had remained during their absence. The approach of scarcity was already beginning to be felt, and corn was to be obtained with great difficulty in the southern provinces. I was an eyewitness on that occasion to the activity of mind displayed by the emperor beyond what he had ever yet shown. He caused statements of the corn depots to be laid before him, as he might have done in regard to those of the army. He very frequently, perhaps every other day, held a council to deliver on the means of procuring provisions, which was attended by all those who were summoned to bring to it the tribute of their knowledge and experience. The emperor now found cause to regret his having discharged the company provisions. The state councillor whom he had placed at the head of that administration was Mr. Marais, brother of the minister secretary of state, and a very worthy man. But as he was not a capitalist, he could do no more than regulate the operations. The emperor came forward with enormous sums of money to enable him to keep up the supplies of Paris to their full complement. A most serious error had been committed by applying to the use of the army, the flour intended for the consumption of Paris, the granaries of which had been emptied for that purpose. If the emperor had been absent during this crisis, great disorders would no doubt have occurred because no one would have ventured to take the responsibility upon himself in money matters and the minister of the public treasury would not have paid any checks drawn upon him without a previous authority from the emperor. He had again, therefore, to attend to everything on this occasion, but 
However great were the precautions he ordered to be adopted, however powerful the recommendation of his own example, he was again under the necessity of advancing enormous sums of money to the board of subsistence of Paris with a view to keep bread down to a price proportion to the laborer's daily wages out of adding 12 or 15 francs to the price of each sack of corn in order that bread might maintain its price of 16 sous for every loaf of four pounds. The result was that bread became cheaper in Paris than in the country. From whence they came to purchase it in the capital in order to resell it in the provinces, thereby increasing the consumption of the capital and consequently the expenses of the administration, which was directed to keep bread down to a moderate price. The emperor felt uneasy at the state of things. He did as far as it was in his own power to do in order to afford relief to that class of the population for which bread is an object of primary necessity. It was but too evident, however, that no adequate resources were forthcoming. We accordingly passed a severe winter in Paris. Many robberies were committed, and although the number of economical ovens was augmented for the purpose of dressing in the daytime, an immense quantity of soup which was distributed at a moderate price, it was found extremely difficult to avert the misfortunes and the mischief to which those miserable beings are driven who are in danger of starvation. Whilst the emperor was using every exertion to keep the articles of subsistence, which are of indispensable necessity for the poor, at the lowest possible price, considering existing circumstances, he was also affording them the means of earning a little more money by their labor. He opened on this occasion the works of the canal of saint Maur near Paris. This canal was to unite the Marne to the Seine by avoiding a circuit of four or five leagues taken by the former river before it reached Charenton. A twofold advantage was in contemplation, the object in view being to line the canal with a quantity of mills, which by accelerating the grinding of corn would diminish the baker's expenses and therefore the price of bread in the capital. These works were carrying on so near Paris that the most indigent families might be engaged in them and in consequence of the Rumford ovens which had been erected find means of subsistence on the spot thus after having had his meals a workman still found himself with the greater part of his wages at the close of the day with the same object in view the emperor accelerated the works of the canals of Saint-Denis and Lourke it is well known that his plan was to join by a navigable canal the great basin of Lavalette with the one which was being constructed in the moats of the Bastille and likewise to connect that basin with the Seine by the canal of Saint-Martin. These works are now completed and the extension they have given to the commerce of the capital is a fact of general notoriety. The monarch, whose genius could form such splendid conceptions, the details of which he followed up with mathematical precision, has a right to claim from us that we should venerate his memory. The emperor did not confine himself to procuring employment for field laborers. He gave orders for cabinet makers and joiners' work in the Faubourg Saint Antoine, as well as every other description of work, together with such articles as were required for the use of his armies. He was profuse in his distribution of money during the winter to which I allude, never departing, however, from his accustomed regularity. He abstained from burdening the finances and met with his own private funds the expenses of the articles of luxury he had ordered and which he applied partly to the embellishment of the palaces and national museums, partly to make presents to a variety of persons, but he transferred to the budgets of the ministers for the use of those respective departments. Any of the articles were sent, those of the interior and of war, for instance, the sums they had severally cost. In this manner, he filled his stores, relieved distress, and reached without any serious accident the end of a severe season, which seemed to presage the heaviest misfortunes. I have seen the amount of the sums which he dispersed for the mere object of paying the difference between the price at which he purchased corn and that for which 
He ordered the bread to be retailed to the people. They appeared to me altogether exaggerated, exceeding as they did ten millions of francs. My intercourse with the administration at that period was such as to afford me the conviction that notwithstanding such powerful assistance, we never could have extricated ourselves from our difficulties had it not been for the extraordinary activity displayed by the emperor on the occasion. He was not blind to the fact, and he felt exceedingly displeased with the administrators of subsistence who had nothing more to show than regular accounts in empty storehouses. It was accordingly his intention to revive and new model the old company of provisions, which he would have established on the same plan as the bank, so as to be able to assist him in case of need with all the capital that might be demanded of it without his incurring the risk of being deceived by some extensive stock jobbing attempts. As on the former occasion in the year 1805, this project was not carried into effect because he was again forced in to a war. It is truly disgraceful that a country like France should be exposed to scarcity of corn. Those countries to which corn is imported from another hemisphere, the very deserts are free from such danger. In fact, nothing can be easier than to guard against the evil. But in order that a constant attention may be bestowed on the subject, it should be left to the exclusive management of interested parties and not of administrators who are regardless of everything else but their personal responsibility. The emperor was well convinced of the truth of this remark and had made up his mind to act accordingly. It has been proved by a series of observations that France was visited with a scarcity every nine years at irregular distances more or less remote from each other according as great events had more or less interrupted the communications. A scarcity had been experienced in 1802 or 1803, another in 1811, and it returned again in 18. 18- 17. The winter was sufficiently dull and barren of amusements. It exhibited none of those events which engrossed the attention of society and passed away in dinners of pure ceremony and with a very scanty run of pleasures. Chapter 15. Prince Poniatowski came this winter to Paris, and the emperor had been so well pleased with his services during the campaign of 1809 that he showed him the most marked attention. He even recommended that he should be equally well received everywhere. And when he was on the point of returning to Poland, he presented him with 300,000 francs. And I think that independently of this gift, he settled another estate upon him besides the one he had given him after the peace of Tilsit. He was less bountiful to Monsieur de Talleyrand. This prince had been of late the object of continual attacks. Some were more or less founded, others were evidently unjust. They arose out of a contest of jealousy and self-love. Monsieur de Talleyrand could turn to good account the advantages which he possessed. He watched his opportunity, and when he had found out the extremity of the armor, he took ample revenge of his assailants by three or four flashes of his wit which penetrated to the quick and told with powerful effect. This irritated them to madness. Talleyrand laughed at the storm he had raised, and the attacks were poured upon him with additional violence. But as Talleyrand kept the society which the diplomatic envoys had retained the habit of frequenting, he was always prepared to retort with an overwhelming advantage all the darts that were aimed at him. He was at last taken by surprise and became the sport of his enemies. I was not aware of the circumstance when the emperor sent for me on a Sunday morning and gave me a sharp reprimand for keeping from his knowledge a fact relating to that diplomatist. If, said he, I have been correctly informed, I will take care to make him refund the 300,000 francs which he has promised to give. This observation had for me all the mystery of an enigma. I waited until he should explain himself, and I learned that he was to receive after Mass Madame Auguste de Talleyrand, who had arrived on the preceding day to prefer a complaint for which purpose she had solicited an audience. This young lady had come post haze from Bern, where her husband resided as ambassador, to appeal to the Emperor's justice against an infamous act 
up Monsieur de Talleyrand, and in order to avoid being refused, she had addressed herself to the wife of the minister, with whom her own husband kept up an official communication. The emperor, who had only learned this young lady's version of the story, was highly incensed at the recital. It fortunately happened that I knew the whole adventure of this alleged debt claimed of Monsieur de Talleyrand, if the business did not altogether redound to his credit, it certainly was not of that guilty character which Madame Auguste imagined. I hastened to inform the emperor of the manner in which the transaction had actually occurred. When Monsieur Auguste de Talleyrand, the French minister in Switzerland, determined to marry, he paid his address to a wealthy young lady of Orléans and was accepted, but her relatives required he should bring a marriage portion of 300,000 francs, without which condition they declined giving him their ward, who, as well as I can recollect, was also their niece. This was a prudent precaution on their part. As soon as she married, the husband necessarily acquired full control over her fortune. It was but proper to insist upon his affording security for the proper management of it. As Monsieur de Talleyrand was not possessed of the 300,000 francs, he came to relate his embarrassment to the prince, who was at that time minister for foreign affairs. He requested he would lend him the money on his note of hand and urged in his own behalf that he was very young. Their fortune must be very unpropitious to him if he could not succeed in acquiring 300,000 francs in the course of his life. Monsieur de Talleyrand not only lent him the money on his written note, but exonerated him from all obligations to pay the interest. This note remained in the prince's possession until his pecuniary losses compelled him to part with it. He had another relation whose name I suppress because I have personal reasons to complain of him. This relation was greatly involved and could not raise any money although his situation was such that it became necessary for him to procure it if he wished to avoid the most painful embarrassments. He called upon Mr. de Talleyrand and related his difficulties to him, requesting he would bear in mind that the name of their family might be disgraced for want of the assistance he so indispensably required. Monsieur de Talleyrand was placed in a perplexing position. He had just been assailed with failures of every kind and had no property at his command than the note of hand in question. He showed it to the applicant, saying that this was all he possessed and that it had never before been brought to light. He observed to him that he made no use of it when involved in personal difficulties because an injury done to the character of the person who signed it would recoil upon himself. He desired him, however, to look out for a person who would lend money on a security, and if he could succeed in finding one, to deliver him the note, reserving to himself at the same time the power to redeem it as soon as he might have the means of doing so. Monsieur de Talleyrand's relation accepted the offer, saying he had already discovered a money lender, but the note had no sooner been deposited by the prince in his hands than it was negotiated upon change and presented to Monsieur Auguste de Talleyrand for payment when due. The latter was not aware of these circumstances. He thought himself deceived and suspected that Monsieur de Talleyrand, whose difficulties had reached his ears, had been under the necessity of inflicting this severe blow upon him. On the other hand, Madame Auguste de Talleyrand was no longer a child. She had the management of her own affairs and wished to know the meaning of the note. The answer to this question was evaded, it appears, by her being told that the money was a pure gift, which, according to a promise made, was never to be asked for, and that the alleged embarrassments of Monsieur de Talleyrand had no doubt compelled him to break his promise. Madame Auguste could not suppress her indignation. She thought it extraordinary that the prince should have lent himself to an act of imposture, of which she was the victim. She instantly took her departure and hastened up to Paris to solicit justice at the emperor's hands. The emperor could hardly credit such an act. He nevertheless suppressed his feelings, said nothing unpleasant to Monsieur de Talleyrand when he presented himself at the audience usually given after mass, but wrote to desire the arch-chancellor would take cognizance of the business, and Monsieur de Talleyrand had to pay the forfeit of the imposture to which he had made himself accessory. 
he made the 300,000 francs down, and Madame Auguste took the road back to Basel. Monsieur de Talleyrand was not slow in discovering that the emperor evinced no disposition to deal leniently with him, but he took care not to show his feelings on the subject, and his conduct became marked with a still greater degree of circumspection. Chapter 16. Events of far too great an importance were crowding upon the political horizon to admit of the consideration of minor objects of local nature. There appeared little doubt of an immediate rupture between France and Russia. The emperor had recalled Monsieur de Calincourt at his own earnest entreaty to be allowed to return to Paris. He probably foresaw the story storm that was gathering and was unwilling to be left in the alternative either of betraying his duties or of being wanting in gratitude for the marked attention shown to him during a residence of nearly four years at the court of russia the emperor himself was not insensible to the extreme delicacy of this ambassador's position though i have heard him ascribe it as well as the deplorable result of his mission rather to the personal conduct of m de calincourt than to the force of events which russia had been enabled to turn to her own advantage whereas an ambassador of france ought to have given them whatever direction he thought proper had he not suffered himself to be drawn from the high ground on which he stood on his first appearance at that court, the emperor sent General Loriston, his aide de camp, to replace Monsieur de Calincourt at the court of Russia. This choice must have been acceptable to the Russians, but it was rather late for a new ambassador to study past events and to avert the occurrence of future ones. Previously to entering into a narrative of this war, I must relate how it was actually forced upon us. For as to our desiring or courting it, I might afford ample proof of the assertion that nothing could be more opposed to the emperor's views if the plainest common sense were not sufficient to remove all suspicion of his having brought it upon himself in the midst of the numberless difficulties he had then to contend with the powers of europe were waging nothing short of a war of extermination against france who no longer fought but in her own defense she had come victorious out of all the attacks leveled against her existence but the emperor was sensible that it behooved her to contract a foreign alliance of an imposing character he had sought a union with russia notwithstanding all the personal inconveniences to which such a determination might subject him since the grand duchess anna pavlovna was only 15 years of age nevertheless he gave up his own feelings to the consideration of the public advantage and it must be admitted that there is hardly a private individual who would not have felt hurt at the reply given to the emperor on that occasion the demand of the princess anna pavlovna in marriage was made privately from one sovereign to the other and ought never to have transpired since it never assumed official character i am moreover of opinion that everything might have been amic arranged because if alexander's reply afforded some indication of mistrust it had also appeared to be dictated by candor the proposal could never have transpired unless one or other of the emperors had spoken of it it is not my object to explain why the emperor napoleon's overture failed to success be this as it may he had just formed a connection with austria and the high policy of the first-rate powers of europe must necessarily have felt the effects of the union he had thus contracted the fact is that after having relinquished the immense advantages which the war had given us over the russians and done so for no other purpose than to obtain their alliance we failed of securing it though we had sacrificed to them the turks and swedes our natural allies and we were now forming a connection with the austrians who appeared to be our irreconcilable enemies such a result could never have been expected if the marriage of the archduchess maria louisa had not been considered as a pledge that every feeling of resentment had vanished 
such being the natural consequence of misfortunes which were yet of recent occurrence. The alliance was therefore cemented with Austria and broken off with the Russians. So true it is that in politics a single step beyond the strict limits which they prescribe not to exceed is sufficient to involve nations in inextricable difficulties. The emperor was anxious for the maintenance of peace in Europe. He could not alone effect this object without keeping the nation continually under arms and overburdening its finances. It had, moreover, been proved by experience that this was not the means of avoiding war, but was, on the contrary, a ground of alarm for foreign states and afforded them a pretense for recurring to arms whenever a favorable opportunity might present itself. The War of 1809 had also proved to him that notwithstanding his alliance of Tilsit, he could not reckon upon the cooperation of Russia in his endeavors to maintain the peace in Europe, so far, consequently, from its being productive of any advantage to him. He was exposed to the attack of a coalition far more powerful than the preceding ones. Whilst he, on the contrary, could no longer enter upon the contest with forces as imposing as on former occasions, the emperor had spontaneously availed himself of the opportunity of contracting with Russia, the only union which France had in her power to form. He was desirous of fixing it upon the firmest basis and his proposal, so far from being accepted, had been coldly received, be the cause of this what it may. The result was but too obvious. The emperor was thenceforth warranted in apprehending that there was no solidity in the alliance with Russia, which he had vainly flattered himself, was firmly established. It was natural for him to suppose that if such were the sentiments of Russia towards him, at the moment when he was endeavoring to form closer ties with her, the spirit of animosity must have greatly increased since his alliance with Austria. He was also fully aware of the important advantage Russia had over him. In consequence of the resistance he met with in Spain, which would undoubtedly become the pivot of a fresh coalition on the first favorable opportunity because there existed no obstacle to a friendly understanding between the Russians and the Austrians, and particularly between the Russians and the Prussians. England, on the other hand, was too much bent upon the object of resuming her influence on the continent, not to have readily discovered this means of attaining her wishes. The alliance of Tilsit had no other object in view than the humiliation of England, or in other words, a general pacification as England was the only existing obstacle to it. Peace was the constant aim of the Emperor Napoleon, who was too enlightened not to discover that the stability of his power and his own safety depended only upon peace. England had in full parliament proclaimed a perpetual war, and she kept up to this principle. France, by connecting herself with Russia, had adopted the only means of attaining her own object. From the moment that Russia drew closer to England, the very basis of the system was attacked, and the relative position of France and Russia towards each other had become more alarming than ever. It was therefore a source of bitter regret to the emperor that the greater ability was not displayed in the management of our affairs. He made every sacrifice and exhausted every means of conciliation in his power to bring the Russians back to the real interests of Europe. He failed in this struggle against the artifices of the British cabinet, against the irresistible efforts of a power which was fighting for its very existence with the inexhaustible resources which the treasures and commerce of the world and her aptitude for business could not fail to place at her disposal. Compelled, therefore, to embark in a war, the Emperor Napoleon had to make up his mind to it and to leave in abeyance the important interests which called his attention to Spain. Into this war he was forced, with all the disadvantages of a position widely different from that in which he was placed previously to his alliance with Russia. He had renounced all the advantages which the Battle of Friedland was calculated to afford him. He had scrupulously fulfilled every condition to which he was pledged, whereas Russia failed in those conditions which were of most value to him, which had alone induced him to form an alliance with her, and upon the observance of which he had too much depended. Russia had gained by our alliance an augmentation of power and possessions as valuable by their geographical position 
as by their extent. She had recruited her strength whilst we were engaged in the affairs of Spain, which would never have been entered upon. If any apprehension had been entertained of the possibility of again returning to the north, Russia was declaring against us at a moment when all our former difficulties were added to those entailed upon us by the Spanish War. France, being compelled to separate herself from Russia, could not conceive a more rational project than to establish a power which, independently of her being her natural ally, might also possess sufficient strength to constitute itself, as it were, the balance between Russia, Austria, and Prussia, so that in the event of a coalition against France, that power, whose existence would have been inseparable from that of France, might make common cause with her and bring to her assistance a mass of physical strength which would save her from the necessity of again placing her population under arms. The formation of such a power afforded the surest pledge of a permanent peace. Everything indicated that the object of France was to regenerate Poland, a country of great importance in respect to its population, already united to us by a common language, by the same habits and recollections. Its troops had acquired a glory which yielded in nothing to that of other countries. She had, moreover, been at all times ally of France and her allies. Independently of these considerations, the portions of Poland which Prussia and Austria had obtained by the partition were already re annexed to her with very few exceptions. And it had been recently stipulated with Austria that in the event of her regeneration of Poland, the Illyrian provinces would be restored to her in exchange for that part of Galicia, which was still under the Austrian dominion. Nothing more remained, therefore, than to wrest from Russia the Polish provinces, which she had seized upon. The Russians kept up in Paris a system of spying to which I shall presently allude, and by means of which they had succeeded in acquiring a knowledge of the forces which France would bring into the field if the war should actually break out. The emperor then began to discover the truth of everything I had formerly reported to him respecting the motives of the stay of the emperor of Russia's aides aid the camp in Paris, and he directed me to find out by every means in my power what were the channels through which he carried on his intrigues and obtained his information. He took at the same time all the precautions which the gradual development of the Russian forces called upon him to adopt. Chapter 17. France had been nearly drained of all the soldiers that could be demanded of her. The Polish troops were withdrawn from Spain and sent to the Duchy of Warsaw. The emperor called to his assistance all the troops he was able to collect from Naples to Bayonne. And as he thus slept in immense space of country unprotected, he thought the best means of preserving it from an invasion would be to take along with him the Austrian and Prussian troops, the only ones which could give him any uneasiness if he had suffered a reverse of fortune, as had been the case at Eilau in 1807. It was also necessary to foresee that when he would perhaps be about to crown his exertions at the close of the campaign, pretensions might be raised by the cabinets of Austria and Prussia, which would render everything problematical, and they would have had the greater advantage over him as they would have been stationed with large forces in the rear of the French army, which might at that time have been at the farther extremity of Poland. Such were the powerful considerations which made the emperor determined to treat with Austria for the marching of a body of 30,000 men as auxiliaries to the French army and with Prussia for 15,000 men. The latter corps was commanded by General York, the former by Prince Schwarzenberg who was then Austrian ambassador at Paris. The emperor caused it to be proposed to him to take part in the campaign as he was already acquainted with that officer and had contracted habits of communication with him. He was greatly esteemed and courted in the Society of Paris. The prince declared that it would be flattering to him to serve under the emperor's orders and readily accepted the offer made to him. The emperor then caused it to be intimated to the emperor of Austria that he should be happy to see the Austrian army commanded by Prince Schwarzenberg. Francis hastened to accept, see to this request, and Schwarzenberg went to place himself at the head of the Austrian corps, which was to cooperate with us. He united the title of commander-in-chief to the character of ambassador, which he still retained, and left the charging de fer in Paris. We had now reached the middle of February, and the emperor's final arrangements were in great forwardness. He knew with the utmost accuracy the precise position occupied 
by each of the corps which were marching towards the Niemen. The troops which were arriving from Italy passed through the Tyrol, Bavaria, and Saxony on their way to the Vistula. The others were marching from Holland and Hamburg towards Berlin, and all the high roads were covered with implements of war. The Russian legation and the aide de camp of the Emperor of Russia were still in Paris. I just ascertained in a very positive manner that this Officer had been endeavoring to persuade General Jomini to go over to the Russian service. This general enjoyed in the army the high consideration due to his talents as a historiographer. In this capacity, he was attached to the staff of the emperor, who set a high value upon his talents. I was more surprised at this proposal of the emperor Alexander's aides de camp as I did not think General Germini had any reason to be discontented with the situation. The fact, however, was so clearly established that I resolved to mention it to this officer. He did not exactly acknowledge, neither did he deny it, so that I saw he had really been spoken to. I threw out some hints as to the opinion which the Russians entertained of those who deserted their own country, and he disdainfully repelled all ideas of such an attack. The aide-de-camp of Alexander had even carried his impudence so far as to attempt to tamper with one of the chief secretaries of the Prince of Neuchâtel, who, as everyone knows, was the major general of the army. His secretaries had, therefore, access to the most important information. The Russian officer felt no hesitation in offering him a large pecuniary bribe. If he would consent to enter into communication with him during the course of the campaign, assuring him that he would not have to incur any risk, care would be taken that he should never have to dispatch any couriers, and messengers would be sent to him on whom he might place the most unbounded reliance. The secretary refused and had sufficient consideration for the Russian officer not to make publicly known his proposal, which would have ruined his character in Paris, but he gave an intimation of the circumstance to the Prince of Neuchâtel, who communicated it to the Emperor on the very day on which I reported to him the particulars to which I have recently alluded. The Emperor clearly saw that the stay of that young officer in Paris had no other object in view than to organize a system of corruption about his own person. He expressed some displeasure at his having been so strongly recommended to him as to induce him to intimate a wish that he should meet everywhere with a friendly reception. A feeling of vexation always accompanies the conviction of having been deceived. The young Russian officer had on this occasion so completely taken advantage of the kindness of the minister with whom he was in official intercourse that he had actually become a little power in himself and acquired an ascendancy which it was not safe to resist. The emperor shrugged up his shoulders at the idea that he should have been urged to bestow so much attention upon a person so little entitled to it, in order that he should be sent away to St. Petersburg. I have just stated that the Russian aide-de-camp had acquired an ascendancy which it was not safe to resist. The following story will show to what extent it was carried, although the emperor had forbidden at the time that Chernichev's movement should be watched. I had nevertheless ordered that the police in that quarter where he lived should keep an eye on him. The commissary in a attention to my injunctions tried to introduce as an inmate of the furnished hotel in which that officer resided an agent of the police whom he directed to watch over all those who came to see him whether the business was ill-managed or whether the agent was betrayed the emperor of russia's aide de camp raised a great clamor against this uncourteous behavior. He hastened to complain to his protector, and the latter went to mention the subject to the emperor, who gave me a severe reprimand, saying, Take no notice of the Russian officer. Monsieur Marais has his eyes upon him, and has succeeded in placing near him a person who watches all his movements. We shall see the result. Leave him to Mr. Marais' care. This happened a very few days before I received orders to watch the habitual occupations of that foreigner. The greater the difficulties thrown in my way, the more I was persuaded that everyone was deceived by this young man whose conduct I was determined to unravel whatever obstacles I might have to encounter in the attempt. The spy who had been placed in his house never saw anyone enter it 
And yet the criminal proceedings on the trial which followed the discovery of the system of espionage he had set on foot have clearly proved that the young man who forfeited his life in the attempt went every day at the same hour, not only to Chernyshev, but also to Prince Kurkin, the Russian ambassador. I had a secret presentiment that the watch over him was ineffectually kept, and yet the case was of so serious a nature that I resolved to clear it up. I knew that the Emperor Alexander's aides de camp was about to take his departure, and that every one was getting dispatches in readiness. Men of all characters and descriptions are to be met with in Paris. I had of late found out one who knew the secret, by which letters were shut up with certain padlocks called a la Rainier. Had not the aide-de-camp left Paris, I should probably have become acquainted with whatever was contained in the press, in the wall close by the chimney of his apartment, by means which it is unnecessary to divulge, I at last succeeded in obtaining possession of the whole contents of the Russian officers dispatched dated 21st February 1812. I drew out of his portfolio the report he addressed to the Emperor of Russia with its accompanying letter, the copy of the instructions given by the Emperor two days before to that Director-in-Chief of the War Department on the subject of forwarding the military equipages of the army and lastly a summary of the organization of the grand army in different corps according to the orders given to the duke de feltra minister of war i first determined to ascertain whether i was not myself the dupe of some snare laid to entrap me and i repaired to the emperor who admitted his having recently given the orders in question the originals appeared to have been copied verbatim. I no longer, therefore, felt any hesitation and ordered the police of Paris to remove every obstacle that might prevent their reaching to the aide de camp's apartment as soon as he should have stepped into his carriage on his way back to Russia. I directed the seizure of every paper, whether old or new, which might have the appearance of a letter or any other like form and the rigid examination of every spot. And I particularly desire that every paper should be brought to me the moment it might be discovered. On the day of the departure of the Russian officer, it occurred to me to pay a visit to the prefect of police with whom I lived on terms of friendly intimacy. I found him closing a letter to my address in which he sent me copies of all the written papers found in the apartment of the emperor of Russia's aide de camp. The originals were on the table and ready to be sent to the Duke of Bassano, the minister for foreign affairs who had asked for them. Though I could not but feel hurt at what a mere accident had enabled me to discover, I was not surprised at it, but would only allow the copies to be sent and kept back the originals. This happened on a Thursday. There was to be a short representation at the Elysee, and I went there, one of the first, in order to converse with the emperor previously to the opening of that performance. He had not yet dined when I arrived and had just sent for me so that I had not to wait any time before I should be presented. He handed me certain papers and said, Minister of Police, look at these papers. You never could have discovered the intrigues of that Russian officer, but he was unable to escape the vigilance of the Department for Foreign Affairs. I opened the packet in his presence and recognized all the copies I had seen two hours before at the office of the prefect of police, and of which I had carried away the originals. I discovered, however, that the papers now shown to me were transcripts of the said copies, set no doubt, because it was foreseen that the emperor would transmit them to me, and that I would know the writing of the prefecture of police. This little piece of deception would not have been carried on with so much care. Had it not been for the apprehension felt that the emperor would learn how those papers had been obtained. It was attempted to persuade him that the discovery had been made by other means than the Ministry of Police of Paris. The letter of the Minister for Foreign Affairs was annexed to it. He hastened to send to the emperor their copy of whatever had been found by his agents at the residence of the Russian officer, adding, that the result of the inquiry must infallibly lead to the discovery of the traitor, and in order to save time, the originals had been kept back. The letter was so worded as to lead to the belief that everything had come to light through the zeal of the Department for Foreign Affairs. 
though this was not broadly asserted. I greatly astonished the emperor when I showed him the original of those copies and explained how and through whose means the discovery had been effected. I did not disguise from him the trick I had played to the foreign department by rendering it necessary. They should send the copies instead of the originals. I told him what indeed I had, but just ascertained that this pretended superintendence of the foreign department was nothing more than a little act of complacence on the part of the prefecture of police, which I had ordered should cease for the future. A man of Monsieur Marais' talents might have found other means of ingratiating himself into favor, and he might have commanded an unbounded credit, possessed as he was of mental resources, well calculated to embrace those mighty events which futurity was rapidly enfolding to our view. Amongst the papers seized in the apartment of the emperor of Russia's aide de camp was a letter directed to him in which he was desired to be at home the next morning at 8 o'clock when some important document would be brought to him. This was a general statement of the army with each corps distinctly enumerated as well as their respective strengths and a particular detail of each branch of service. The letter, though hastily penned, did not appear to be in a disguised handwriting. It was found under the rug near the chimney. There was no accounting for its having been left there. After having long searched in vain, I found in the offices of the War Department a clerk who recognized the handwriting and told me the name and profession of the writer, another clerk attached to the administration of the War Department. I sent for him and exhibited the letter he had written to the Russian officer. He admitted it, confessed his intercourse with him, and drew up a declaration of all the entreaties and promises resorted to for the purpose of inducing him to connect himself with some of his comrades in the office, especially relating to the movement of the troops in the War Department. He had yielded to the seductive arts of the Emperor of Russia's aide-de-camp and delivered him a copy of all the orders issued by the Emperor to that branch of service. From the office relating to the movement of the troops emanate all orders for the march of the soldiers, the generals, and the inferior officers. The labors, in short, of every other department eventually merge into this office, which drew up every fortnight for the emperor's information, a general statement of the army. With the changes which had occurred in the interval, this statement formed a large quarto volume, which was unusually bound up previously to its being sent in, as the most rigid severity will always sooner or later relax, they had, at last, been so neglectful at the office of the Minister of War as to send the book to the binder by an office messenger, a veteran soldier, who was directed to wait until it was bound and bring it back with him. The clerk, who had been bribed by the Russian, took advantage of this circumstance. He placed one of his comrades in the way of an old soldier they appeared to meet by mere accident. The messenger was taken to a tavern where, whilst he was in a state of intoxication, his book was taken from him, which consisted of sheets arranged in order but not tied together. It was carried to an adjoining room where one of the two clerks waited in readiness with ruled paper upon which they had only to copy the figures. This business was the sooner dispatched as the paper was of the same form and arranged in the same order as the original statements in the book.